Russia, China, and Iran, which is the most assertive, the most aggressive in this area? I believe it's China. China more than Russia right now? Yes. President Trump signing two executive orders last night banning U.S. transactions with Chinese tech firms Tencent and ByteDance. My name is Simone Gao, and I'm a journalist working in Washington, D.C. The CCP leader Xi Jinping believes big data is China's most important national resource. What could they do with that advantage? Every mobile app has a widely open backdoor that can do whatever they want to. It's no secret that China prefers a Trump loss and a Biden win. But in this program, I'll uncover, in the age of AI, there is something the Chinese Communist Party wants far more than the Biden presidency. This is TikTok. It puts the world in motion and sets it to music. You create, you love, and you share. For much of the younger generation, this is the world. Owned by the Chinese technology company ByteDance, TikTok is one of the world's most popular social media apps. It has been downloaded more than 2 billion times globally and maintains a total of 100 million active users in the United States. Given that the app has been around for just over two years, how has it become so popular so quickly? As I learned from AI experts, TikTok is designed to get you addicted. The first time you open it, it doesn't know what you like. It'll recommend some default pages. Those pages are decided by your locale. His name is Jack and is a former employee of Huawei, China's largest telecommunications company. For security reasons, we've blurred his face. Jack is a big data and AI expert. When you register, it may also ask you to make some simple selections. It can guess what your age is, your gender, and also the version of your phone's operating system, so it can vaguely confirm your identity. According to these conditions, it may give you recommendations for what videos you may like. He told me that TikTok systems as multiple tags to every video clicked on by a user. The more videos you click, the more TikTok knows about you. Through this data collection and their powerful algorithm, they can deliver the exact videos you like. Before you realize the tactics, you are addicted to what they deliver. The story of TikTok is the story of data, big data. TikTok collects massive amount of data from its users. According to researchers and as reported by Bloomberg, TikTok starts collecting data the minute you download the app. It tracks the website you are browsing and how you type, down to keystroke rhythms and patterns. The app warns user it has full access to photos, videos, and contact information of friends stored in the device's address book, unless you revoke those permissions. The app also tracks everywhere you go using your IP address and GPS coordinates providing the app with your precise location while working, voting, attending protests, traveling, and simply picking up milk from the grocery store. Are we okay with this? Through my conversations with data security experts and everyday users of social media apps, I came to realize that most adults know that information will be collected about them and will be used by marketing companies to target advertising effectively. This is true of most social media platforms in America. But for communist China, data is handled in a very different way. Can you compare uh, Google, Facebook, and Amazon's way of collecting data with that of TikTok? Google is, as I mentioned, compared to all the others, it actually collects the information more aggressively for the commercial purpose. But remember, it's commercial purpose. It does not use that to, to hack you or do something like that, right? But TikTok is a different story. I mean, it's kind of a dangerous animal because TikTok uses, collects the data, uses the data to improve their algorithm. This is James Chiu, a former Apple executive he explains to me how China collects data differently from the Americans. I mean, China, you know that there is no privacy. I mean, who cares, right? So the company actually collects every single thing of persons. And um, 
because of that, I mean, because they have the capability of collecting all the information from a person, and they can they can actually train their uh, deep learning model to perfect. In, in this case, uh, U.S. company and Western companies cannot compete with them. The privacy law said if one company has like you know ten different apps, the information collected by each app can only be used by each app. You cannot combine them and interrelate them and then synthesize uh, new data out of them. Okay, so that is significantly restricted. But for, for Chinese company, there is no such a rule. That's why they can build better uh, recommendation uh, algorithm. So this, this is a very dangerous company. I mean, when it collects your data, they know who you are, they know what you like and dislike. They can actually manipulate you. In other words, while TikTok does aggressively collect its own data, its powerful algorithm may not be built solely on data collected within the app. TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, has been proven to be a data vacuum entity, amassing a large amount of user data, not only from its three popular apps, but also from its many tech partners. According to James, the intention of the TikTok's algorithm is to encourage a compulsive use of their app. Once it becomes a compulsion, users are more likely to be manipulated. Messaging hidden in seemingly harmless videos goes well beyond making money. TikTok represents a model the CCP is using to influence the world. Retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Robert Spaulding explained to me the CCP's grand vision for big data and AI. So Kai Fu Lee says that China seeks to become the Saudi Arabia of data. So think about the entire world's data and collection of that data as being tantamount to having power over the world. This is the way that the Chinese Communist Party sees the global internet, globalization, our connectedness. That's why Xi Jinping goes to Davos and says we must work together, we must you know, continue globalization, we must continue this global connectivity because it enables them to take the data into China behind the Great Firewall, create this huge data ocean that then their uh, artificial intelligence can learn from. So this is, their, this is their goal because they know that they can use that just like TikTok is used as a platform to influence. They can use that to influence not only their own people to basically not know the true history of China, but also to influence the rest of the world. This is the power that, quite frankly, we built. Silicon Valley built this power. Mm -hmm. We built it and made hundreds, trillions of dollars. The Chinese Communist Party saw that and said, not only do we want to have control over that economic engine, we want to have the ability to uh, influence socially and politically as well. This is a, really the convergence of technology and warfare for the 21st century. The Chinese Communist Party has been seeking an ideal time to test its AI advantage. An ideal time to see if their AI can be used to manipulate a world power, especially the US. That time is now. Leaders on both sides of the political aisle agree that the 2020 election is one of the most important since the nation's founding. It is critical that the U.S. heed its intelligence community's warning that China is now actively seeking to influence the outcome of the election. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien told CBS's Face the Nation on August 9th that China and Russia are targeting the nation's election infrastructure with cyber attacks. I want to ask you about that specifically because the intelligence community issued this very sharp warning on Friday detailing uh, efforts to interfere. Looking at the statement from July 24th, though, the language there says adversaries are trying to access candidates' private communications and election infrastructure, uh, and that's at both the state and the federal networks. That sounds an awful lot like what Russia did back in 2016, but now it's well, happening on your watch. So what are you doing well, to stop it? Well, well what we're doing is we, we've got our cyber teams in place. Uh, DHS is working very hard to track down those uh, uh, malign actors. But again, is it it's Russia not just again? Russia. Well, look, we know it's China. 
Uh, we know it's Russia. We Tampering know it's Iran. with election infrastructure? And well, a absolutely. Trying to access Secretary of State websites and that sort of thing and uh, and collect data on, on Americans and, and en engage in influence operations, whether it's on TikTok or Twitter or uh, in other spaces. So, uh, no, it's a, it's a real concern. And, it, and it, but, it's, but it's not just Russia, Margaret. It's the Chinese don't want the president reelected. So a lot of conversation about you and your latest moves. Let's talk about that. In August 17th statement to Fox News, Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe revealed that China possesses a greater national security threat to the U.S. than any other nation, economically, militarily, and technologically. That includes threats of election influence and interference. Two weeks later, on September 2nd, Attorney General William Barr nailed down the Chinese interference once more. Of those three countries that the intelligence community has pointed to, Russia, China, and Iran, which is the most assertive, the most aggressive in this area? I believe it's China. Which one? China. China more than Russia right now? Yes. Why do you say that? Because I've seen the intelligence. That's what I've concluded. What are they trying to do? Well, I'm not going to discuss that. To this but time. they're trying to help who, who win? I'm not going to get into that. David Kaminer, a former member of the U.S. Army Intelligence, told me more of the intelligence community's insights. What the CCP wants is turmoil in America, because that could create paralysis for America on the world stage. It's almost a political extortion. If you don't elect Biden, the riots will continue. If you don't elect Biden, the Chinese, or perhaps the Iranians, could move somewhere and give us a national security crisis. So the CCP clearly wants Joe Biden to win, and he's doing everything it can with data, with AI, and in other areas to make sure he does. If they have to pick between Biden victory and maybe it create this uh, chaotic America, which one do you think they will pick? They can have both, because if Biden wins, the right will not stand out. Hopefully there won't be violence, as the left uh, is uh, perpetrating on the streets of America today, but the right will become even more aggressive, which means there will be more turmoil, there will be more violence on the streets of America, there will be more riots. In fact, Kamala Harris said recently that if she is elected, even if she and Joe Biden are elected, the riots should not stop, nor should they stop. So you can have both Biden, you can have paralysis, you can have turmoil. David told me the fact that the Chinese players are trying to hack into the Secretary of State website is particularly concerning because those offices are responsible for administering elections at the local level. They're trying to gain access literally to election results. Now these are, in every American state, there is a Secretary of State's office at the state level that coordinates elections. That goes down to county election offices and bureaus. What they can do, not only in state elections, but even in local elections, if they can hack in, they can change results for close elections, um, they can get um, biographical material on voters, they can get um, uh, voter turnout records, they can strike at the very basic basis of the American democratic process. It's a very, very dangerous game they're playing. Now, do our people like the FBI, NSA, other people know they're doing this? Yes, they do. But it's a, it's a race to see who is more technologically adept and who is paying attention. We better hope we win this one. One from U.S. intelligence about Russian efforts to cast doubts over mail-in ballots. This year, that in watching the news coverage of the election interference, I came to realize that when the American mainstream media talks about foreign meddling in the U.S. elections, Russia is still the focus. They are attentive to harms done four years ago. Yet, there is a greater threat on the horizon a threat backed with the technology and data necessary to do far more damage. If U.S. citizens are truly concerned about a foreign power's ability to influence a critical election, they should consider this example. His name is Han Guoyu, Taiwan's National Party of China's presidential candidate for 2020. While initially popular as a candidate, he ultimately lost to the incumbent, President Tsai Ing-wen, largely due to Taiwan's overwhelming rejection of the mainland Chinese government that was backing Han. While Han's loss was due to the Chinese Communist Party, his initial rise was their doing as well. The key milestone of Han's political career was his victory in the Kaohsiung mayoral race. 
Han was largely unknown through the first four months of the election season. A day after formally announcing his campaign, however, a Facebook fan group was formed. The page promoted Han through talking points and memes, constant sharing of fake news about his opponent, and public shaming of his critics. By election day, Han had more than 66,000 members on the fan page and received a surge of fan posts just hours before being elected in a landslide victory. Dr. Piu Ma Shen, assistant professor at National Taipei University, did a study on Han's sudden rise to popularity. First, China created many websites that published and shared a large number of articles on Han Guoyu and fake news on Han's opponent party, the Democratic Progressive Party. They then generated a massive amount of search requests on Han Guoyu. They literally overwhelmed the system with their requests. By doing so, Google's algorithm worked to push Han-related news that the CCP generated to the first two pages. According to Dr. Shen's research, a significant percentage of the fans on Han's Facebook group were not from Taiwan; they were from mainland China. To further demonstrate China's involvement, Dr. Shen's group tested Han's name on the internet for the final two months of the campaign. They found that Taiwan was only 16th on the list of countries searching for information on Han. Jack told me the CCP is obviously behind the efforts, and this is how they did it. A large number of search results can come from people's natural behavior, and it can also come from bots automatically publishing articles. They can come from IP addresses inside China, from IP addresses in Taiwan, or IP addresses from any other country. In this way, Taiwan may have less searches than other countries. According to the Financial Times. Key governmental departments in Taiwan receive tens of millions of hacking attempts each month. Then, between 2015 and 2017, that number tripled. These attacks, intended to steal sensitive governmental data and personal information, were primarily perpetrated by China. Does the CCP have enough resources to do things in America that's similar to what they do in Taiwan? That's the scary part. They have been building over the last few decades control over our corporate institutions, our Wall Street investment banks, our political system, academia, our think tanks, our law firms, our PR firms, our consulting firms. You know what we forget is the Chinese Communist Party doesn't have to use a PLA to do all this. They can pay Washington PR firms. They can pay Washington consultant. They can pay Washington law firms, and they do. The Taiwan story took a drastic turn, though. Prior to the presidential election, massive demonstrations broke out in Hong Kong against the Chinese extradition law. Those protests and the CCP's brutal response to them. Led the Taiwanese people to reject a future under the rule of the CCP and a president indebted to them. They chose the incumbent president Tsai Ing-wen, who, though not popular at the time, is consistently tough on the CCP. It's safe to say, if it's not because of Hong Kong, Beijing would have secured a Taiwanese president of their choosing. The game to influence a major political election is complicated and can be costly. Sometimes it takes on the most unexpected form. This is Christine, an immigrant from China, and a successful real estate agent in the affluent Orange County area of California. Like many among the extensive Chinese diaspora in the U.S., Christine continues to habitually use Chinese apps. I use a lot of Chinese apps such as WeChat, Chinese TikTok, Douyin, and etc. Because it is very convenient for me to use these apps to communicate with my friends and family in China. WeChat is the world's largest standalone multi-purpose mobile app with a billion active users worldwide, mostly Chinese. Douyin's popularity comes from its short, entertaining videos. Much like sister company TikTok, 
Both are owned by ByteDance but operate independently of each other. With Douyin created for users in China and TikTok designed for international use. Christine says the news about America has been circulating rapidly on these Chinese apps, and they all strike one tone. Since the pandemic began, I found there have been a lot of negative reports about America in these apps. Many of them are false, strange reports. They don't reflect what I know about the situation here. I support Trump, but what I saw on WeChat and Douyin is all negative information about Trump. It seems that there are a lot of pro-Biden information on there. 美国才是当前全球战略安全与稳定的最大威胁。Although Douyin uses powerful algorithms to determine your interest and target the recommended content accordingly, algorithms are not the only factor in what Douyin shows to each user. In China, the most posts Douyin users see are from the party's mouthpiece, People's Daily. Simply because Douyin is required by the government to push People's Daily's content to its 500 million active users, as a result of such powerful promotion, the People's Daily has almost 100 million followers on Douyin today. This is a recognizable and reoccurring strategy within China. TikTok functions in a similar way to Douyin, only instead of recommending the CCP's official propaganda. TikTok pushes political content that comes from other app users. Ethan, a TikTok user from the U.S., told me how it works. Once I started to use a TikTok app, I push a lot of anti-Trump or pro-Biden videos to me, but I did not even say or select、uh, that I am interested in politics.、Um, but After a while, like I use the app for a while,、um, the anti the anti Trump video become a little bit fewer, and I started to saw some、uh, pro Trump videos as well.、Um, that might be because I did not like or follow any of those anti Trump videos, but、um, the anti Trump videos still like eighty or like sixty percent around that. In the politic videos,、uh, recently it changed. It might because that I did not even really watch those anti-Trump videos. So like right now, it's only maybe a quarter or like less than that. But there are still anti-Trump videos that push to me. TikTok has a sophisticated AI model making recommendations to its users. When a user begins to use TikTok without being classified by the system as pro Biden or pro Trump, TikTok displays neutral contents to the user. I quote the neutral since it is based on TikTok's standard. In reality, there are many more pro Biden contents being displayed to the user anyhow. Based on the Data collected on the user's browsing searching habit, TikTok can classify the user as a conservative user quickly. Then it starts to display a few pro-Trump contents to the user while mixing various pro-Biden contents. When TikTok figures out the user is not very interested in politics, it starts to display fewer political contents. Uh、mm-hmm. huh. So the goal of、uh, TikTok is to, you know, number one, do not get th- this user upset、uh, to the degree that he just won't use TikTok anymore. But at the same time, TikTok still pushes、uh, pro Biden content to him in a degree that he can tolerate. That is absolutely right. Three months prior to the presidential election. A coalition of TikTok creators launched a national "Talk the Vote" campaign. By their own definition, the campaign is meant to empower Gen Z to vote and to mobilize young leaders in the fight for progress. In just four weeks, the hashtag "Talk the Vote" had gained more than 18.2 million views. The videos posted to the hashtag are often tied to issues of social justice and equality. The majority of videos either express support for Biden and Harris, or directly attack Trump. 
those offering support for the current administration are virtually non-existent. TikTok, to American popular culture, specifically to possible young voters in America, is a Trojan horse. Uh, the CCP understands that politics and everything in this nation is affected by popular culture and TikTok is a way for them to get into this. The Talk the Vote campaign had not yet launched when it met with David, yet he predicted this very strategy leading into the election. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if close to election day, since a lot of young people use TikTok, we'll see a massive get out the vote drive for Biden on TikTok trying to get those young people. It might not even necessarily be specifically for Biden. It could be get out the vote because they know young people tend to vote Democrat, tend to vote more liberal, and in this election cycle might tend to vote for Biden. So it is a way for them um, to have pop culture goals, to have those goals come into the election process, and to influence through even small things, um, through movies, through entertainment. Again, as we said, a lot of CCP money in Hollywood. Through all those aspects, the American elections, because for a very long time, popular culture has meant as much to American politics as any policy has. This is a proven strategy that has been demonstrated in movements organized by Americans. Here's an example. On June 20th, 2020, Trump held his first rally in four months. According to the Associated Press and the Inside Edition, the 800,000 had registered for tickets online, but only 6,200 people showed up, leaving the stadium less than half full. TikTok users and K-pop stands claimed credit for the low turnout. It is an unmitigated fact that K-pop stands hold so much power on the internet. I am like convinced that you guys could orchestrate a murder over Twitter. And like that's, that's just the power you hold. And if you guys haven't heard, um, Trump is planning a rally um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma on Juneteenth, which is a slap in the face to black people. This man, I mean, he's, he's not too smart um, because tickets are available by two for free on his website if you just put in your phone number. I'm saying BTS stands should do this, but what I'm absolutely saying is that they should absolutely go and spam that website and take up all the tickets so that you don't have any people in the rally. K-pop stands originally connected as a way to share their love of K-pop, but their mission later broadened to include direct political activism. That activism is often conducted on TikTok, a place where pop culture and politics best converge. This video alone received over 2 million views. So I recommend all of those of us that want to see this 19,000 seat auditorium barely filled or completely empty, go reserve tickets now and leave him standing there alone on the stage. What do you say? Millennials and Gen Zers who are now old enough to vote wield significant political power in the 2020 elections. While they tend to be less politically active, with fewer than half voting in the 2016 election, this year looks to be different. What impact might they have on the election? A substantial one. There are 86 million millennials and Gen Zers who are eligible to vote, representing 37% of all 235 million voters. How many of them use TikTok? We don't really know. But we do know that 63% of the 100 million active users in the U.S. are under the age of 30. The youth have, to date, now had the political impact they were capable of. TikTok just might change that in 2020. So do you think that TikTok can influence people's uh, political opinions? TikTok has the potential to influence people with manipulated information. They are good at it. It inherits the AI model from Toutiao, which is ByteDance's popular news platform. Toutiao helps the Chinese government monitor and manipulate mass opinions. Do you think TikTok has the potential of influence of American people's uh, political stance? What TikTok needs to do is to fine-tune the AI model by using the data collected from the Western countries. It is a piece of cake for TikTok. This is what I have learned so far. The danger the CCP poses to the US through TikTok are twofold. First, it uses pop culture as a Trojan horse in order to influence the younger generation. Second, it uses collected American data to perfect this AI model for further manipulation in this country. 
On September 18th, Judge Carl Nichols of the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C., revoked the Trump administration's ban on TikTok, leaving it available for download in U.S. app stores through November 12th. The Trump administration originally demanded that TikTok be sold to an American company or face a complete ban within the U.S. A proposal emerged between TikTok, Oracle, and Walmart. But despite an early signal of support from Trump, questions over exact ownership percentages and the data hosting arrangement suspended the deal. By allowing the Chinese Communist Party to have any you know, interest whatsoever, whether it's in understanding the technology or it is in allowing people to actually physically touch the code or the hardware where this um, code runs, it's all vulnerable. TikTok's use of a powerful Chinese algorithm and its aggressive way of collecting data has revealed another possibility, the likelihood that apps from China may be operating with secret access keys, master password, and secret commands called backdoors. In spite of that risk, James told me that thousands of Chinese apps are accepted in the Apple and Google app stores every year without the proper vetting process. So how does Apple vet Chinese apps that are trying to enter its app stores? A lot of Chinese apps actually sneak into the U.S. app store as if it is native, right? So that, that is the first problem. The second problem is when Apple app store checks the apps, it checks very basic stuff. So basically, Apple published a set of rules and the, every mobile app needs to follow those rules. Apple only checks off those kind of things. But as for whether the app is kind of uh, tracking the customer behavior and, uh, you know, sent the private data into a third party server or, you know, use that for commercial purposes or other purposes, Apple has no way to check it. So in that sense, every mobile app has a widely open backdoor um, that can do whatever they want to. Silicon Valley may be the country's best line of defense against malicious apps from China, but they seem uninterested in that responsibility. How much control or how much reign does the national security establishment have on the Silicon Valley? None. Zero. In fact, uh, Silicon Valley despises the national security establishment. Now, there's a few people that have worked within um, government, but what happens is many of them are entrepreneurs or people that think outside of the box. And of course, what you find when you come to Washington, D.C. is it abhors you know, people that think outside of the box. They want conformity and they want you to be bureaucratic. So they don't tend to last very long and they don't tend to make much headway because in order to actually innovate in government, you have to have patience. You have to be wily and you have to kind of figure out where is the way that you can actually make um, you know, progress happen. There's not a lot of people that are willing to do that um, because they get frustrated um, by the bureaucracy. In 2017, General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party Xi Jinping announced a bold plan for Beijing. He predicted that China would catch up with the United States in AI by 2025 and lead the world by 2030. China may have reached that goal earlier than they had planned. Although America still leads in cutting-edge AI technology, China has surpassed America in AI application. They did this by collecting more data. More data means better AI. I believe that in the eyes of Xi Jinping and his colleagues, big data and AI are more than just another curious technology. Xi Jinping openly stated the big data is the most critical national resource for China. Why would he believe so? Likely because the CCP knows exactly what big data and AI are capable of, how they can be used to control over their own people and manipulate other countries. Best of all, the party is confident that their political system guarantees China a reliable advantage in data collection and AI application over the free world. I mean, what do you think is the biggest strength America still has today over China? The Constitution. I think the Constitution as an idea 
as a foundation for how to build a society, a blueprint, if you will, for how to build a human society where you have human frailty and you have to deal with it and you have to ensure that the way you deal with that is to ensure that no human or humans can have ultimate power. I think that is the strength of America. Our, our, our total existence as a free society where people are allowed to live as they want and reach their true present, potential is at risk from the tools that we ourselves built and the Chinese Communist Party have appropriated and begun to you know, use extensively to undermine our, our, our society. It has been 244 years since this nation was founded. At that time, a claim was made. We hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe if these claims are true, they must be true then, true during the Civil War, and true today. If you go back to the founding of this country, it wasn't everybody that decided, hey, we wanted a free country. It was a few. It was a determined few that were not going to be subjugated, that they were going to stand up for their rights, and they were going to find other people that were like-minded, and they were going to work together to build this new land. And those people exist today. We just have not been fighting together. So yes, absolutely, we can win. We just have to stand up and fight. Fighting together, Democrats and Republicans. Absolutely. Thank you for watching our documentary movie. If you want to support our future work, please share this video with one person who you think would really enjoy it. Thank you for your support and see you in our next video.